بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله continue on in our study of بلوغ مرام in the comprehensive book in chapter one of good manners and we reach the second hadith in the bab in the chapter uh, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala which is another illustration of how good manners is an important part of Islamic conduct and that Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani <coughs> Rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasi'a he put this good manners in the comprehensive book after all of those abwab or uh, abwab of fiqh those chapters uh, related to the issues of fiqh from those issues which are as we mentioned prior to this, those issues which deal with uh, ibadat, you know, uh, issues of, of worship, to fiqh or issues of mu'amalat, of issues of how, uh, of the various ways in which we uh, have uh, transact conduct transactions and interact with one another. And the comprehensive book deals with those things such as good manners and good conduct as in it is comprehensive and it is not dealing specifically with those issues of uh, what we uh, of fiqh ibadat or fiqh of mu'amalat uh, of transactions and social interactions but rather this is more social interactions on the micro scale uh, in which human beings and the mu'minin specifically the the conduct in which they should interact with one another and the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said look at those who are less fortunate than you but don't look at those who are more fortunate than you, so that you will not underestimate the favors Allah has bestowed upon you, Mutafakun Alayhi. This hadith agreed upon in its authenticity by uh, and collected in uh, Bukhari and Muslim. And this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala has immense uh, benefits with regards to to uh, how we conduct ourselves with one another. And this hadith illustrates the important characteristic of gratefulness and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the favors that he's bestowed upon you. And that's something we need to reflect upon. We need to take time and ponder. And the ni'am, min ni'amillah, the benefits from amongst the many benefits or, or uh, uh, favors that Allah has bestowed upon us cannot be counted. But one of the ways we can show gratefulness and that will assist us in being appreciative is by conducting ourselves in accordance with this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which is that we look to those who are less fortunate. Look to those who do not have what you have. So in this hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam mentioned he said, Asfala minkum. So, 
he advised us to look to those beneath us. So then that raises the question, as Imam bin Uthaymin mentions, who are those beneath us? The Imam, he mentioned that this is in reference to the favors Allah has bestowed upon you, regardless of whether that is favors pertinent to this life or material means or favors with regards to your religion, your deen. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, وَلَا تَنْظُرُوا إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ فوقكم. And do not look to those who are above you. Meaning that we should look to those who are less fortunate because when we look to those who it appears have more than us, maybe they do have more material wealth than you. They have a, a, a larger car. They have more cars. They have expensive cars. They have wives. They have wealth. They have this in the dunya. Those, those things, those material, the things that are material from amongst things I mentioned. Or, perhaps, they are greater in Iman and Taqwa. And they are much more knowledgeable than you are. So, by when we look to those who have more material than us, and perhaps even look into those who are favored with more knowledge in a greater position, uh, how come this one is favored with knowledge and they're able to spend their full time calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they make a, a decent living at it or they're compensated with this and I have to do like this and I have to do like this and there's no compensation or there's whatever or this and that. So, Ben Othaymin mentions that this netma from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes both those ni'am or those favors or blessings that are uh, material and those blessings which are uh, related to the religion. So that's, uh, and, and when we look to those people who are, have more than us, as I just mentioned some examples, that can cause you to belittle the ni'am, the favors that Allah has bestowed upon you. And I think that's very clear. And we can all think of our own examples that when you look to those, if you're looking, you're busy and you just have a simple car, but it gets you to work. But your neighbor has two cars or three cars and they have various types. They have the SUV. They have a, a, a nice sports car and then they have a nice family car. They've got all three and they're all brand new. If you busy yourself by looking to what they have, you will not be grateful, more than likely, with what you have. You will begin to complain, and you will begin to complain and be displeased with who? Possibly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or at least showing some ungratefulness to the blessing that is bestowed upon you. And that is a very powerful uh, lesson to reflect upon in relation to this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. This hadith also is giving us guidance and wisdom because it is showing and acknowledging the fact that uh, and affirming the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made people differently and favored people with different blessings that they have different levels 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitabihi al-kareem, Under kayfa faddalna ba'aduhum ala ba'adu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his mighty book, Subhana, he says, and this is in the this is in the imperative form. And we've said this countless times, Al Amr Yafid al Wujub, that whenever there's a command in the imperative form, then this uh, from the book of Allah, the Sunnah, the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the asal of the origin of that, that, that statement is that it is an obligation unless there's other evidence to show otherwise. Ta'i. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says under, and this is the imperative form, this is fi'l uh, amr, this is uh, the imperative form, it's a command. Kayfa fadalna ba'dahum ala ba'd. So look, to the way that we have favored some uh, favored some of them over others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us to look into the creation, look around you, and analyze and contemplate and think and reflect on how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is favored people differently. Some of the people are blessed with abundance of wealth. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our wealth so that we could do khair with it. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. And some people are blessed with great intellect. They're very intelligent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored them with the, the favor and the blessing of being an intellectual individual, a, a thinking, reflective, and person of knowledge and wisdom. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with that as well. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa and also strength. Some people are blessed and bestowed with physical strength. Very, uh, we have a, 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 a vast difference between the way people are physically. Some people are, they're very big and they're very strong and they're very fast and they're very athletic. They're very fit. They're very whatever. Maybe they're very attractive. Some people don't have that same favor. Maybe they're very thin. Maybe their body is sickly. Maybe they are, you know, everyone is favored with something different. And I'm not saying that the sickness isn't necessarily a favor, but I'm just trying to say that we are different. And with that being the case, but perhaps the person who's sickly is very intelligent. Or they are a person of strong iman favored in that and they're going to be favored in the hereafter so this favor if we look through the creation and we uh, reflect upon that ayah we will see that people differ in their levels and that uh, some of the people are in have a higher status than others some of the people have more wealth than others some of the people have more strength than others some of the people have greater intellectual capacity than others Likewise, this can be, as we mentioned, with regards to religion and ilm and knowledge. Some of the people are favored. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored them to be able to memorize. Some of the people have been, are, are favored to memorize. And one of our mashayikh, I recall, when we were sitting in one of his, uh, he gave us a sitting for the Western Westerners. This was in Yemen, in Dar al-Hadith, in Shehem. Sheikh Abdullah Amari, uh, hafadhullahu ta'ala. And we asked him some questions, and he mentioned to us a story about someone, one of his, uh, he was talking, the whole point was to mention to not stop seeking knowledge. Don't take a break. Because some of the people are favored, as he mentioned, when he was in Damage as a student, that he used to, uh, one of his colleagues used to be able to memorize, I think he said, 50 hadith a day with the isnad. Very strong. I can't imagine that. That's, that's, that's a great ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then that same individual, because of things in the dunya, was forced to stop their talib al-ilm and forced to really focus on their dunya so much so that they be, you know, stop seeking knowledge or what have you. And the, the point of mentioning that 
is to show that we're all different with different favors, and that's a favor dinia. That's a favor as far as memorizing and as far as hopefully practicing, that that is a great netma from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be able to memorize like that. What we gain from the fawa'id of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the first thing is husna uh, irshad al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is that we gain the excellent of the guidance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. And this is because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam in this hadith, he gave us a qa'ida, a qa'ida haqiqa, a very real practical qa'ida, a very real practical principle that we can apply in our lives and that is to look to the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do so by looking to those who have less than you and so that is a qaida haqiqi that is a a a a, 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 a grounded in based in practicality a principle based in practicality Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam also shows us the husna ta'aleem of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The excellent way that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam taught his sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and that is because in his teaching sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam that in the case of this hadith that he mentioned a command or uh, and not just this hadith, but in other uh, hadith, and, and often he would mention a command, and then he would mention either the, or the hukum, the, the ruling regarding something, uh, and he would mention often the ta'lil, meaning the reason for it. So he gave you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that understanding of what you're practicing, or what is an obligation upon you, or what is commanded and demanded of you in the shara. Excuse me. And this is from the husna ta'lim, the excellent way of teaching of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That shows completeness, that when you're learning with something, think about a professor or think about a teacher that you have, that when they give you examples and they tell you the reason, it sticks with you more. So Ben Othimid, he mentions two fawaid or two benefits with regards to this way of teaching of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, first, the first benefit is that it increases a person's comfort in that they know the wisdom, they know the ruling with regards to something. This helps to increase your comfort with practicing it. If you really understand it, not that just, oh, I'm commanded this. The Quran commands this. The Sunnah, uh, the Prophet commands this. That's, uh, that's the, the, the origin that all of us have to do. Uh, obey Allah and obey, his, and obey His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But when we know the wisdom or the reasoning behind a hukum that comes in the hukmullah, hukmillah, or the ruling of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it increases your comfort in your heart when you practice it because you have more knowledge about it and it gives you more certainty. It gives you more surety of the reasoning why. You have a, a, a clear understanding of the divine hikmah. And it helps you to be uh, to, to practice that command. The second faida that he mentions with regards to this is that uh, 
when you are aware when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does this and that's a sunnah for us to follow when we're teaching when we can give examples when we can uh, make it clear and give the reasoning behind something if we understand that reasoning then this also gives further clarification and cl uh, further affirmation that the Sharia is complete and inclusive and perfect and suitable for us as human beings. That affirms that stronger, uh, it, you know, gives us even greater certainty with regards to that issue. Hadith 1238 narrated An Nawas ibn Sam'an, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. I asked Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam about righteousness and sin. And he replied, righteousness is good character and sin is that which revolves being doubtful in your heart. And you dislike people and you dislike that people come to know about it. Ru'ahu Muslim. In this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the hadith of uh, Nawas ibn Sam'an radiallahu ta'ala an. This hadith, the subject topic of this hadith is uh, what is bir? What is uh, righteousness? And how that characteristic should be exhibited upon the tongue and actions and limbs of the believer. And that that is from what? It is from good conduct. It is from husn al-khulq. And as we'll see, as the ulama mentioned with regards to this term bir, and as in the Arabic, he said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al bir. So he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the term al bir. You know, what is bir? Well, ithm and sinfulness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, he said, al bir husn al khulq. So this is the munasib or the usefulness of this hadith to this bab or this chapter is that uh, Nawas ibn Sam'an radiallahu ta'ala he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the term what is bitter? You know, he asked him about bitter so that way he could know how to practice it. And he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about sin so he could know how to stay away from it. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam defined al-bir as Al-bir husn al-khulq. He said, Al-bir, it is uh, good manners. So that is the munasa, the usefulness of having why Imam uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani put this, ter this hadith uh, in this chapter, in the chapter of good manners. Because the... Uh, the term al-bir, one of the, it's a comprehensive term, and one of the meanings that the scholars uh, deduce from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is that it means good manners. And this is what we see from this hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. So before we get into that, we need to have an idea uh, a little bit more about the term Bir. And that will give us more insight into this hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. So as a linguistic term, when we talk about bir, uh, it has many meanings in, in accordance to the shara. Sometimes it means iman. Sometimes it means uh, righteousness. Sometimes it means the same as taqwa. And sometimes it means uh, as a linguistic term, meaning sidq, or truthfulness. So, Ibn Faris mentioned, he said, فَأَمَّا الصِّدْقِ فَقُولُهُ الصِّدْقِ فُلَانِ وَالْبِرَّةِ وَالْبَرَّةِ وَبَرَّهْتُ يَمِينُهُ وَصَدَقْتُ uh, so here he mentions Ibn Fadis, Rahmatullah Ali Rahmatin Wasiya.
He says, for as, and as for truthfulness, the term truthfulness, sidq, that uh, it is also said uh, that someone uh, was truthful, so-and-so was truthful. He gives an example, so-and-so was truthful, well, barra. And he was, uh, so here, uh, and he had uh, this righteousness, if you will. And so here the term, it has the meaning of that a person was righteous and truthful. And as a, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّ وَجُوكُمْ كِبْلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ And it is not from righteousness that you turn your faces towards the east and the west. Letting us know that in and of itself, just facing the Qibla was not, that was not the maqsud, that is not the intent. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions later in the ayah that, uh, that, a bitter, that it means iman. Walakin al-bir man amana billahi wal yawm al-akhir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that bitter, that righteousness is uh, the one who believes in Allah in the day of judgment. So letting us know here the meaning al-bir refers to what? It refers to iman. So letting us know that the, the, the term is a very broad term and it depends on the verse or the sunnah. But in general, there are some general meanings as we'll see that some of the ulama they mention. And from the ulama, uh, or from some of the other nusus uh, that we see, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned about bir. He said, bir, he said, al love, al bir, ida utlika tanawal jami' ma amar Allahu bihi. Kama fi qawlihi ta'ala, inna al abrar la fi na'im. Wa qawluhu subhana, walakin al bir man at taqa. Wa aidan, fi inna al bir ida utlika kan musammahu. Musamma taqwa. So here he mentions that the term bir, you know, this term that was used in the in the in this hadith, that if it uh, is mentioned when it was mentioned, that it includes everything uh, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala commands, and that's similar to the meaning that some of the scholars or the scholars mention about taqwa. And he says, and then he gives an example, like in the statement where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily, the abrar, abrar comes from the term bir. Verily, the abrar, 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 However, al-bir min taqa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily, al-bir, uh, al you know, pious, piety, is for the one who has taqwa. You know, the one who, who puts up a barrier between them and sinfulness. You know, they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that lets us know what? That bir has a relationship with taqwa of goodness and righteousness and piety. And so sometimes the meaning is very similar. And then there are many other examples that uh, in the book of Allah, in the sunnah of the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Uh, also, we see that from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some of the Term, some of the other uh, narrations of the Prophet وسلم, that give us insight into this term on Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal al-hajj al-mabrur laysa lahu jaza ila al-jannah qil wa ma al-birru wa ma al-birru hu qal it'am ta'amil wa tayyib al-kalam tayyib so in the hadith of Jabir, radiallahu ta'ala, 
He said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Al Hajj al Mabrur leysa lahu jazaa jannah," meaning the accepted Hajj. You could say in a in a and and look at the term that's used here, al Hajj al Mabrur, and that comes from the term bitter, bitter, yubiru, uh, abrar, mabrur. So al Hajj al Mabrur, it comes from the term bitter, and here it refers to the accepted Hajj, meaning a person has done it, made their Hajj. And it is accepted by Allah because they had ikhlas lillah. And they did it in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So this is uh, following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it includes that, that's that comprehensiveness of this term uh, uh, bitter. And so here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Al-Hajj al-Mabrur laysa lahu jazai la jannah. So this accepted Hajj, there is no reward except for jannah. Meaning that the person, you know, earns jannah. If their hajj is accepted, meaning they did it with a class and in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Also, there are many other ahadith, but so as not to prolong our speech and get more precisely to the hadith itself, we wa we wanted to illustrate that this term is comprehensive. In another narration, an Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and then qal qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, alaykum bi sidq, fa inna sidqa yahdi lilbir. So here in the hadith of uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, uh, alaykum bi sidq, it's upon you to be truthful. Or, you know, you must be truthful. For verily truthful, truthfulness, it guides or it leads to al-bir. It leads to what? It leads to righteousness. So here we see that the term Meaning, uh, al-bitr is comprehensive, meaning righteousness or goodness. So this is uh, to give us that uh, insight into this term, al-bitr. Uh, Imam bin Baz says, in, in regards to what we gain from this hadith, before we get into uh, some of the other important uh, aspects about this hadith, is that in general, uh, this hadith is an illustration of how the shara uh, exalts this characteristic of righteous conduct, of husn al -hulk. And that's why we can never belittle having righteous and uh, righteous conduct. And husn al -hulk, that this combines uh, smiling and striving in righteousness to do good deeds and things that are that make other people happy and and, and and righteousness also it is inclusive of ceasing uh, uh, harmfulness ceasing to cause harm to people so that shows us that that uh, as many of the Salaf mentioned like um, Ibn Mubarak Rahmatullah Rahmatun Wasiya uh, explain that this is what uh, bitter is inclusive of. And so Ben, uh, ben Baz, Rahmatullahi he is highlighting that fact. So he says, فَيَنْبَغِي لِلْمُؤْمِنِ أَنْ يُكُونْ طَلِيقَ الْوَجْهِ عِنْدَ اللِّقَاءِ وَمَا ضِيُوفِ طَيْبَ الْكَلَامِ يُبَدَلَ الْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَقْفُلَ الْأَذَى هَكَذَا يُكُونْ حُسْنُ خُلْقِ so uh, the Sheikh then mentioned as a comprehensive uh, definition and those things which are all inclusive or how you can practice this this bitter this righteousness. He said it is it's an obligation upon the Muslim. That he has a, uh, a, a, a a joyful face, you know, that he's smiling, a smiling face when he meets people. And that when he's with his guests. And that he should have good speech, righteous speech. And he should strive to do righteous deeds or do righteousness or goodness. And that he should cease to do harmful things. He said, this is what is inclusive of husn al khulq, of this, of righteousness. And that is to have a smiling face, good speech, and striving in righteousness or goodness, 
and ceasing to do sharm. So that shows us a habit of Allah that it's very imperative for us to exhibit those righteous characteristics. So this hadith of Nawaz ibn Sam'an radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it shows how the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een that they wanted to know about righteousness. And Nawaz ibn Sam'an specifically radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he mentioned, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And that's why he says, Sa'altu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al birri wa ithmi. I asked him about, uh, you know, this term bir, you know, righteousness and sinfulness. Because they're the opposite. And this shows his hirs, his hirs, his striving to find out those things which would benefit him in this life as well as the next. And those things which uh, for him to stay away from in uh, this life and to avoid from causing him uh, uh, sinfulness and punishment in the hereafter. This was the Sabila Sahaba and why they asked questions. They asked questions to seek ilm al nafia beneficial knowledge, those things that will benefit them in this life as well as the hereafter. Unlike many of us, we ask questions to trap people for entrapment, to test people, to question their level of knowledge instead of wanting an answer sincerely, but we spend a lot of our efforts with a suqast, you know, with a wicked intention. And this is something we have to avoid. Instead, we should want khair. And, and it shows us the difference between us and how the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een. And what further illustrates this is the hadith of Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Qal, kan al-nas yas'aluna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala al-khair. Wa kuntu as'aluhu ana shar. Mukhafata an yudrikani. Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, he said the people used to ask the Prophet about goodness because they wanted to do good and they wanted to get to Jannah. And he said, and I used to ask him about evil out of fear that I would fall into it. So here he wanted to know. Again, this is al Nafi as well. Asking about the khair and the sharr. So it shows how the Sabila Mu'mineen, the Sahaba to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Radiallahu Ta'ala Majma'een, the Sabila Salaf Asaleh, the Minhaj of the Salaf Asaleh, is built upon asking for Ilm al Nafiya, beneficial knowledge, as was illustrated in this hadith. And this was beneficial knowledge because he was asking about bitter, and he was asking about what is sinful in order to do the bitter and avoid the sin. And we mentioned some of the things uh, of what the, the bir, uh, some of the, the comprehensive meanings that the, the ulama of the past, the ulama of language, and the, some of the ulama, uh, the salaf, and Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, what they mentioned with regards to this term. As far as ithm, as was mentioned in this hadith about sinfulness, he said, I asked Allah's Messenger وسلم, about righteousness and sin. And he replied, righteousness is good character and sin is that which uh, revolves being doubtful in your heart. And you dislike that people come to know about it. So think, reflect upon that. Because the sinfulness, the ithm, well, ithm ma haka fi sadrika. It's that thing which moves in your heart. Because, for example, the person who's on righteousness that they, uh, from a sign of Iman, and from being from Ahli Iman, is that when you do something sinful, you don't feel comfortable about it. You feel your heart is not settled by that. You feel the sin, even if you enjoy an aspect of the sin, or you wouldn't do it, you feel sorrow afterwards. So it doesn't sit well in your heart. This is the affair of the mu'min. Unlike the one who does the sins and they're not concerned. And this is something we'll talk more in uh, uh, detail about. So in this regard, some of the 
benefits of this hadith because you could spend a book could be written about this hadith as well as many of the ahadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But some of the benefits of this hadith, first, hirs al-sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala'inu majma'een, that the sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala'inuhum, they were vigilant in knowing the sharia rulings. And this is evidence because Nawaz radiyallahu ta'ala'inuhu, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an al-birr, he asked about uh, righteousness and he asked about sinfulness. So it shows the Sahaba, عنه, they were vigilant in knowing Sharia rulings and those things that would benefit them in this life as well as the hereafter and those things that uh, would prevent them from benefiting in the hereafter. They wanted to know so they could avoid it. Another benefit of this hadith is it, it this hadith encourages us to have righteous Manners, husnul khulq, ma Allahi wa ma ibadillah. So this hadith encourages us to have righteous manners or righteous conduct with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and with the creation. And as we mentioned prior in in in, in our first uh, dars or lecture in this uh, chapter, that this husnul khulq. And this adab, there is an adab ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning there are certain mannerisms to observe with your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you, meaning that you worship him in according to a manner that pleases him subhanahu wa ta'ala without bid'ah, without uh, violating and, and doing shirk and those things which displease him. So this is husna adab ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you're obedient to his commands. And husna adab ma khalq, husna adab, meaning you have a righteous uh, conduct with the creation, meaning that you do those things which please people, that make people happy, that are within the context of the sharm. So smiling at people, good manners with people, in, in inviting people, doing all of those things from some of the ahadith that we've studied and those hadith we will study that the sharm defines as husn al and righteous adab. So it shows us the importance of good manners and it encourages us. This hadith encourages us to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in righteousness and being good with his creation. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith shows us that those things which cause conflict in our heart and... If a person has a righteous, healthy heart, then they will know that that's a sign, perhaps, of sinfulness. So the person with a healthy, righteous heart, they will uh, feel discomfort when they do sin or something. they come across something sinful. They won't feel comfortable. This, you know, I don't really feel comfortable involving in this. This seems like it has doubtful things in it, gray matters. And that goes back to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, shubahad fastabara li dinihi wa irdihi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in another hadith, he said that whoever leaves off the doubtful things, then they have protected their honor and they have protected their religion. They've protected their honor and their religion. Why? Because they didn't violate it by jumping into something. They didn't know whether it was halal or haram. They were confused about the matter, and it was something that they weren't sure of. It was doubtful, and it causes doubtfulness in the chest. So it shows that that doubtfulness can be doubtfulness with regards to the hukum of whether it's halal or haram, but it can also be a taraddid, you know, a, a lack of comfort and fickleness about something uh, because the sinfulness of the activity, that you don't feel good and comfortable about indulging in that activity. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that the person who has a healthy heart, that Allah the Almighty uh, will gives him this scale to judge whether something is sinful, meaning they won't find comfort so it's, it's actually a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's given some of his, 
his creation, the people of Ahli Iman, that they just won't feel comfortable about doing certain activities, saying certain things, involving in certain, engaging in certain practices, because their heart doesn't feel comfortable with that. And I'll give you a real example that when I was a new Muslim, I recall, I was around some, uh, some Muslims who had been Muslims for many years, but they were on bid'ah. They were on pure bid'ah. I had met them and they became my companions for a short period of time. I was in a new city. I was in California, in Berkeley, California. And they were Sufis. And they used to always invite me to go to drum circles and stuff. And I was a new Muslim. I didn't really know, but it sounded funny to me. It sounded like something that I didn't uh, hear from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ with my limited knowledge. Likewise, they used to invite me to actually engage in the muta, meaning he said, why are you making this difficult upon yourself? You're in the university, you're surrounded by all these beautiful women. All you have to do is make a contract with one and you know, you, you won't be suffering. Then you can, they, this is what they're not telling you about. Many of the scholars of the past, they practice this. So he wanted me to practice the muta. He wanted me to just grab a woman instead of making her my girlfriend or what have you uh, and just, just to relieve myself. And my heart didn't feel comfortable with this. I didn't know. I didn't know the hukum. He, he was telling me that the scholars of the past did it. He was telling me and making it sound beautiful and sound, sound something good. And that way I wouldn't suffer that because I knew it was haram. And I was in co-ed situation, co-ed dorms. And I was being challenged in my iman daily and hourly. But he wanted me to take that way out. But Allah gave me just enough iman and to where I felt discomfort in, in indulging in this. I could have easily went with my desires and easily went with that, but something, it just didn't feel right. And so that's a sign of goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives some of his servants. And may Allah bless us with that. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Our last benefit of this hadith, and there are so many, is that From this hadith, we also see that if a man has a healthy heart, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it so that they dislike, or a person with a healthy heart, that they will dislike for people to see what they are doing when they fall into sin. And that's a sign of iman. That you don't want people to see that you're doing, you're looking at this haram. You're listening to that which is haram. You're doing that which is haram. That's a sign of iman. It's a sign of iman. It's not a hypocrisy, but in fact, it's actually a sign of iman that you don't want people to see that. Even if you're doing something which is illustrating an act of hypocrisy, but on another aspect is showing iman because you feel discomfort. You don't want people to see that you're indulged in this. And you want to leave that sin. And so that's a sign of Iman. And in another hadith, and that's a sign of shyness, that they don't want people to see their sinfulness and their mistakes. Uh, as for the person who has no shame, then they fall under and, and have no concern whether people see their sins and they're open with their sins. They go to the club and they go to the club with a group of Muslims. Or they're disbelievers, then they have no boundaries. You know, but even amongst disbelievers, there are different groups who do feel shame about sinfulness and don't like to do it, but they don't have the same Islamic precepts that we have. And the point being is that as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna mimma adraka nasu min kalam nabuwa, nabuwa ta'ula, idha lam tastah, fasna' ma shit. The Prophet Sallallahu said in another hadith, he said, from the speech of the earlier generations of prophets is that if a person uh, you know, has no shame, then they can do as they please. Meaning, not that it's a command to do sin, no, but it means they have no shame. They have no boundaries already then there's nothing to prevent them from, from doing uh, something shameful because they're already immersed in sinfulness and they already have no concern with the people. So if you have no shame, then that shows that you'll do whatever you please. 
So do as you do as you please because you already have no shame that you have a girlfriend. You already have no shame that you're in the music world, not just listening to music, but you're in the music. You're listening out loud so that your the believers can hear. You you have no shame about what you're doing. So this shows us that from the sifat of the mu'min is that they have shyness about their sin. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad.